Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY, on the OTCQB AMYZF, and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclicode.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ted Dixon, CEO and co-founder of InkResearch.ca, Canada's first online financial news and research service, providing insider news and knowledge to investors. His website, CanadianInsider.com, home of the Canadian Insider Club. Welcome back to the show, Ted. Jim, thanks for having me back, and thanks for everyone listening in. Is this uh, a good time to get into the oil patch? Well... We've had a a nice move here this summer in crude oil and uh, even natural gas has bounced off the bottom. So we've had a a move up in in the energy stocks. And we kind of see this as part of a longer term sort of bull market that started in in uh, mid-2020. I know there's been a a pullback uh, last year, but the trend still seems to be higher. However, I think we're getting towards sort of the later stages of that longer uh, bull market and, and we're not in the like the, the use of baseball now we're not in the ninth inning I don't think but uh, you know we're not in the early days so at this point we're starting to see a divergence you know between like winners and losers and whereas like back in in middle 2020 we know that when oil on the futures markets went into negative territory for a day uh, after that, you know, the whole sector kind of moved higher once crude uh, rallied. I don't think we're going to get those kind of moves again where all the boats get lifted by a rising crude price <clears throat> because no, the, the environment is now uh, much more volatile. And, you know, a, a lot has, has changed, has changed structurally. You know, for example, you know, in Canada, we're going to have the Hopefully, hopefully, the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion uh, next year in operation, uh, knock on wood. Uh, so that's like a positive structural change, you know, and so there's there's both positive and negative changes. So so this is, I think, calling for, uh, you know, being a little picky in terms of uh, the stocks that one may be considering in the oil patch. And, you know, what, you know, we look to, of course, is our ink edge. Uh, criteria, which we look at valuations, uh, how much you know insiders are buying and holding. We call that an insider commitment and price momentum, which is kind of an, a, a good take on overall market sentiment towards that stock. So, what uh, what we look for are you know, the stocks that are in that top thirty percent, ideally in the top ten percent, and. Now, we don't look at like the apps in the fundamentals of a project or, you know, the fundamentals of well economics. You know, we leave that up to the fundamental analysts. But generally, how you can use our signals is a is a conviction check, right? If you really love a project and, you know, that's always a, a behavioral issue that, you know, we all most of us struggle with from time to time getting kind of attached one way or another to a stock. And that's never a, really a good idea. You always want to kind of look at it day by day and, and think, okay, if I were starting today, would I buy this stock? And y- if you look at our ink edge rankings and if they're, if they're, if they're sunny or mostly sunny, well, that's kind of re- uh, confirming your positive view. But if it's like rainy or cloudy, which puts them in the uh, bottom 10 or bottom 30% of our rankings, I think it really serves as a reality check on a positive outlook on a stock, even if you think the fundamentals are, are, are good, because maybe some structural changes have happened. Um, maybe you you know bought it based off of um, you know statements that management has made that aren't panning out. So uh, that's how we use it. And what and what we've noticed is that 
uh, lately, there's fewer stocks in the oil patch. There's a, there's 128 uh, in the uh, stocks that we cover in the Canadian oil patch. And there's 58 of them that uh, have a sunny or mostly sunny. So that's like 58 stocks are in the top 30 percent. And so that's just under half. So it's still not bad. You know, it's still pretty good. But uh, it's not like 50 percent. It's not or 60 percent of the of the stocks are in that category. You know, it's it's a minority now. Small. You know, a big. You know, big representation but it just goes to, sh- to point out that you know, it is getting a little harder to find a uh, really good opportunities based off of our signals and when you combine that with our ink energy indicator which looks at the number of stocks with buy um, keep buying by insiders versus key selling it's under a hundred percent it's actually approaching 70 percent so we're seeing insider profit taking pick up uh, the, again in a bull market, that's not to be uh, that is expected. That's not a big surprise, but it still, you know, shows that maybe uh, there is room to take some money off the table and maybe redeploy it towards names that still, you know, have uh, good uh, insider activity, good valuations, you know, and and the market still likes. So, so it is time to be picky. We get into that in our Inc. Energy report for August, uh, which uh, we uh, published actually on the last day of the month, uh, in August on uh, Thursday. So, um, yeah, for those who are members uh, of the Canadian Insider Club, take a look at that. Is Canada's uh, energy sector optimistic overall? Overall, yes, it's not as optimistic in terms of price, uh, at, you know, prices, uh, when I mean prices, I mean stock prices as they were uh, earlier in the year when, when the stocks were struggling. Remember, insiders are usually contrarian, so they're going to be more optimistic about their stock prices going up after their stock prices have gone down, right? So, um, you know, after a stock's been rallying for 52 weeks and is at all-time highs, you may be seeing some profit taking saying suggesting they're not as optimistic that the stock can keep going up so that's kind of how we look at it but yes in general the canadian oil patch is still pretty good much better than the american oil patch where our indicator is uh, below 50 percent and i think it reflects a a lot of things uh, between the two and you know that we are seeing some structural improvements in canada you know with that tmx pipeline for example and in u.s you have the political risk with the Biden administration. You never know what they're going to do next. Now, the Canadian dollar, around the 73-cent mark uh, compared to the U.S. dollar, is that a reflection on the Canadian economy? Because usually there's some kind of connect between energy prices and the Canuck buck. Is there a disconnect there, or is it just poor government uh, policy, or is there something else behind a lower Canadian dollar? Well, I think over the past decade, uh, the dollar, the Canadian dollar, has become n- not only sensitive to uh, energy prices, but I also think uh, real estate money flows from China and elsewhere. Not you know, it's not just China, but China is a big investor. So you know, I think that explains a lot. And you know, the in the uh, with the Chinese real estate market, um, you know, probably having peaked. Uh, the source of inflows into Canada from China for real estate are not going to be as strong as they used to be. Uh, I don't think it's going to dry up by any stretch. And, you know, we also have uh, some restrictions in place, uh, which are, uh, you know, are they having any, any impact? I'll let, let someone else comment on that. I'm skeptical because uh, there's apparently, I think if I'm, if I'm, unless I'm to be corrected, uh, foreign buyers can still buy vacation homes. So, but in general, though, I think it's, you know the macro uh, environment in China, or the real estate environment. I think the macro environment in China is getting overly. Pe- the, the West is becoming overly pessimistic about the overall Chinese economy, but the real estate group in in China is definitely uh, it has some challenges, and it's going to take a long time to work out those challenges. And I, I think that's on the margin. That's a, a, a negative for the Canadian dollar. And, uh, you know, I think you'd need to see the oil price really, you know, break higher for it to compensate for that. And maybe we'll get that. We'll have to see. Uh, we'll have to see if oil can break out of its uh, range here. Uh, certainly, though, just, you know, circling back to the oil patch, you know, with, with if oil and 
prices can stay in this range. There's still a lot of companies that can do okay. Not some companies are not so okay, but uh, again, that gets back to the divergence between the winners and losers. So, uh, yeah, the oil patch uh, would benefit from stronger oil prices. Canadian dollar would benefit from stronger oil prices, and we probably need to see that if if there's any hope for the Canadian dollar to, you know, break up towards that 80 cent level. And that's, you know, that that's going to be a, a tough wall to climb. We'll have more with Ted Dixon right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ted Dixon. Ted, what's going on in the stock market that's caught your eye? Well, we've got this ongoing debate, narrative debate between is inflation uh, heading back towards the old, I call it the old Bernanke days of, uh, you know, the previous decade where it's going to settle back to 2% and we're just going to have this kind of slow growth and all you have to do is buy tech stocks and bonds and that's basically your your portfolio allocation. There is a huge amount of, of, uh, of this, uh, there's a large group of investors who believe that, want that to happen, whatever the case may be, and you don't have to go very far on Twitter or YouTube to find um, some very high profile analysts and strategists pumping U.S. Treasuries and, you know, I don't know if <laughs> they get a commission from the U.S. Treasuries for all their pumping of U.S. Uh, US bonds. I'm joking. Uh, the US, as far as I know, the U.S. government doesn't pay commissions for their bonds, but uh, maybe one day they, they might have to, but no, no that's a joke. But um, no, so uh, the other side is that inflation is more structural. It's, stay, it's going to stay higher for longer. And that, yes, even if the U.S. economy slows down a bit, inflation is going to be higher. So bond yields should be higher than where they are now because they're, they're still, you know, there's still this, this, this belief that, it's, that inflation is going to just go back to 2% and growth is going to flatline. Uh, so uh, that's in the, in the process of working out. But, you know, what we are keeping a really close eye on is the gold-silver ratio, which uh, looks at the price of gold over the price of silver. And... It has uh, tried five times now this year to uh, take out its uh, its uh, six month low, basically six month low level around seventy eight, seventy just seventy seven on that on that ratio, and that, that ratio is on CanadianInsider.com, by the way. It's free. Take a look at. It. But uh, we're looking for that to break lower. Uh, if it does break lower, then that then I think it's off to the races for the junior miners and the mining industry and other commodities as well. It is having a hard time breaking lower, though. And so it may not break lower. It may break higher and because it's also kind of been trying to break through its uh, six-month high, which is you know around 87. So we're in this kind of 10-point range on the gold-silver ratio. So I'd keep a close eye on that, you know, if you, you know, we think there's light at the end of the tunnel. That's the, that's the, um, you know, that's the question we ask in our Inc. Top 20 Mining Report, which we also published today, on, and you can get that on Canadian Insider if you remember. Uh, we think that it is going to break lower. Insider sentiment is very, still very high in the mining industry. And I just think that, you know, those who are anchored in the Bernanke period are going to be disappointed for a whole bunch of reasons that we've talked about in previous reports and on this uh on this uh, podcast uh, before, uh, uh, as you'll probably remember, Jim. And so we think it will break lower, but we don't know when. If I knew when, that would be great. But, you know, it may take another year. I, let's hope not. But, uh, you know, we're, that will be the market forces that determine that. We've got some big data, some more. And when people come back from their uh, tra- from their uh, uh, summer break uh, next week, we'll get more price action. The other thing I want to watch, I'm watching very closely, is the money center U.S. banks. Uh, uh, you know, we're talking about the big ones. Uh, Citibank's chart uh, is looking pretty iffy. Uh, you know, it's it's been, uh, it, you know, it's rallied here the last uh, week or so, but it's kind of, you know, it's rolling over. It was rolling over earlier today. And it, I'd watch Citi, uh, Citigroup 
uh, and see how that's doing because it's not it hasn't been behaving that well over the past month. And so, if uh, the money center banks start to head back to those those lows we saw in March, that would also be a concern. And uh, it, it, uh, until the Fed kind of throws in the towel on this rate hike stuff. And I think Jerome Powell missed a big opportunity in Jackson Hole to set out a framework for his policy going forward. Instead, he talked about not being able to, you know, see the stars through the clouds, which is, you know, just an, which I thought was a complete um, missed opportunity and kind of a bizarre thing to say. Uh, but uh, in any event, uh, what, uh, the, the, if the money center banks force Jay Powell's hand, like why would they be weakening? I don't know. Like I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a bank analyst. I, I don't, uh, I don't profess to have any specific insights into that, except that I can w- look at the charts and the charts on that on chart on that stock, for example, does not look very good. And and everyone was uh, talking about the regional banks, the regional banks. So no one was really paying attention to the money center banks. But in the, in the next uh, two months, I'd be watching the gold-silver ratio for you know possible inflationary breakout. But I'd also be watching the money center banks for a possible deflationary um, um, situation, which would force the Fed's hand because, above all, Jim, they want to protect the U.S. Uh, banking system. And that's you know part of their unwritten mandate but it's a very important one for them and uh they do not want um they do not want the uh, the banking sector uh to be in trouble we saw that what they, how quickly they responded in march and we suspect uh, that they would respond quickly again if there was any other issues there so i'm afraid we're in for uh for a, a very volatile fall, and uh, I know there's a lot of the, a lot of the big U.S. bank uh, analysts are talking about a big stock market rally coming up here in the fall. I mean, I hope they're right, but we don't see it in our insider sentiment. The U.S. insider sentiment is pretty bearish right now. It's consistent with a bearish uh, index, a little broad index. You know, there's always opportunities at the stock level. We try our best to identify those. But, uh, yeah, U- U.S. insider sentiment's not looking very good right now. But, uh, yeah, keep an eye on those money center banks and the gold-silver ratio. Uh, electric cars, we thought there'd be a huge demand for the commodities that go into them, things like uh, copper, zinc, lead, everything you need for batteries. That that Have we seen that, and do we expect that to pick up? Well, it depends. <laughs> I guess it depends on kind of what gauge you're looking at. I mean, the um, there's a bunch of different lithium prices, so... You know, and it's kind of a, it's kind of a. I don't call it a murky market. It's just it's a it's a very uh, fr- a fragmented market. So I think one has to be uh, careful at uh, looking at uh, at, uh, at lithium prices. Um, you know, the 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 copper price has been um, uh, hurt by the situation with um, the. China housing. Okay, so uh, housing was a big driver of um, of uh, of copper demand, and 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 China is the biggest copper consumer in the world. So uh, copper's been been hurt by this uh, real estate situation. But uh, there are reports, and I tweeted one out from a, a, a actually a, a Bank of America analyst, I believe, it was in 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 China, um, uh, indicating that. Uh, they believe that copper demand, because of the EV uh, revolution in China, and it is growing in China. I know here, it's kind of like you see a Tesla here and there, and you you know, and you, you're seeing some of these charging stations pop up. But in China, the the EV penetration is soaring, and uh, they believe that China is going to have double digit growth for copper over the next few years, and it's in double digit growth this year. But you wouldn't know it looking at the copper price. So to be honest with you, I don't know what's going on with the copper price. And, uh, you know, what's going to happen, I guess, at some point, shortages will materialize and then copper will go flying higher. But by then it'll be too late because, as you know, Jim, and all your listeners here know, you can't just turn on a copper mine. Mm. It's not kind of, it's not like oil, you know, where, okay, OPEC, uh, you know, wants to increase capacity. Okay. Saudi Arabia will bring on a million barrels a day next month and everything, you know, will calm the oil price down. So <laughs> it's not going to work that way with copper. <laughs> I mean, so 
at some point, it's going to get very interesting, I think, especially if this uh, this lady from Bank of America was right uh, in terms of uh, uh, China copper demand. But, uh, uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll have to see. It's just taking a long time to play out, I think. Hmm. And, of course, too, uh, recently we've seen governments turn down major mine, mining developments in Canada which right. is kind of disappointing, well, yeah. and yet they want people to drive electric cars. By the way, that analyst name is uh, Matty uh, Zhao, Zhao Z, uh, Z-H-A-O, and it is on my... I posted on mm-hmm. Twitter on the 21st of, uh, of August, and it's a link to an interview she gave on Bloomberg, so it's worth watching for those uh, for those uh, uh, who are interested in that, in the copper demand thing. You know, in Canada, uh, as we talked about a, a couple of shows ago, the, the I, the provinces, you know, are kind of off doing their own thing. They haven't got the memo, and uh, and, and I'll exclude BC from that. Uh, unfortunately, BC doesn't have any lithium to speak mm-hmm. of. But the, uh, the, the I think the framework that the EB government and you know sort of was started under Horgan uh, with the First Nations uh, um, bringing First Nations into the kind of exploration process, it, it it's showing signs of working. But look mining companies have to stay on top of their First Nations relationships, and that's not easy. And we've seen examples in B.C. of, of a company. We saw one company, and it never really made it high on our rankings, but I'm not going to mention the name, but it got caught um, uh, uh, off... Uh, it got caught with a surprise development with, with one of the First Nations groups involved uh, uh, that are... Uh, in the, the ter- you know that have territory in the project area um, and you know that's uh, you got to be on top of it and um, then there's others that you know strike deals that hold and they're able to get multi-year permits uh, drilling permits and uh, but you know it, 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 it's it's it is a very tricky business it's an important business but if you can manage it right in BC it can actually, I think, be a net positive to help you get approvals and get and get a mining license. We're, we've got a major, um, major gold mine that's going to probably uh, start um, uh, uh, production in uh, central British Columbia um, next year, and um, uh, basically, it's it's a Blackwater mine in central BC. And it's going to, it, it, it's a big mine, and uh, you know they just got they got their permits this year, and it didn't. Once they got the right management team involved with this mine project, it it, it got going, and so it can be done in British Columbia. I'm not so optimistic in Quebec. Uh, I, there's, I mean, when you have the federal government approving the Galaxy Mine ahead of the Quebec government, and the Quebec government still hasn't approved it, when you've got, uh, you know, there's a junior miner I know that's still waiting on their bulk permit, their bulk sampling permit that they applied for in the fall. You know, it, it, there's, uh, there's, there are problems in the in the um, um, yeah, with the uh, in Canada, you know, in some of these provinces with. Uh, on the regulatory side, so uh, it is an issue, and uh, you know, it, uh, but it's not just Canada. I mean, the U.S. I, I don't think is much better, and but the U.S. is uh, state by state. Well, in Canada, it's kind of province by province. So, yeah, the West is, is you know, it's a Western disease, right? This kind of bureaucratic red tape disease, where um, oh yes, you have one arm of government saying EV transition, let's go for it. We don't want to be, uh, and we don't, and we want to diversify from China, but you've got these other. Parts of government that say, "Well, wait a minute, not in my backyard." You know, what about the, what about the, uh, you know, the the salmon over here, and what about the, you know, the the foliage over here? You know, I, so it, it's kind of a, a dysfunctional situation in Western democracies right now, and there's there doesn't seem to be the political leadership to really treat, you know, to really treat it like a climate emergency, which it's framed as, and you know, whether one believes that or not, just just. Let's agree that that's what politicians call it. Well, if it really is an emergency, you know, you have to act like it's an emergency and you have to get these projects to, uh, done. But that's, you know, those are still the exceptions, not the rules. So, but does that come back? It comes back to your question about the, you know, the commodities. Eventually, 
yeah, I, I, I got to see that copper is going to keep going unless we throw in the towel on the climate emergency and say, well, we didn't really need all those EV cars, you know, and, oh, we spent all those money on those battery factories, but, you know, now something else has come along. And I, I don't think there is going to be something else for a while that comes along. It's either they throw in the towel and go back to hybrids uh, or, um, or um, you know, we're going to have these big, uh, commodity shortages. But when is that going to happen, Jim? I don't know. Maybe it's going to happen around the time the gold-silver ratio breaks uh, below its uh, recent lows, so we'll have to see. Ted, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thanks, uh, Jim, for having me back. My guest has been Ted Dixon, CEO and co-founder of IncResearch.ca, Canada's first online financial news. You can find him online at CanadianInsider.com and on Twitter at Inc. Research. If you have any questions for Ted or for any of our guests, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. Our YouTube channel, Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at HowStreet. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.